morning, Crossroads. There we go. There we go. I know. I know it's in you there. Um, well, welcome, everyone. And once again, uh, my name is Alex, and I am the lead pastor here. And we are in this series called Ask Me Anything, where we're talking about really tough topics. We've, we've covered doubt. We've covered politics. We've covered uh, God's design. And now we're talking about a violent God. What? Um, these are topics that we see in our culture, and we, uh, we want to speak into this from a space of, uh, from God's perspective. And so we will be looking at Genesis 6, uh, Genesis 9, Jonah, and Galatians. And if you have your bulletins, you can follow along with me. Um, I also just invite you into the conversation. Feel free to pray, to cheer, to clap, to just move as the Spirit moves in you. Uh, when I was telling Kathy I was going to talk about violence uh, in church, she said, just don't do it. Problem solved. Sermon over. Go home. I was like, thanks, Kathy. <laughs> but, uh, but you ever wonder how uh, does violence in our scripture today compare to violence depicted in the scripture or how about, how does entertainment, media, social media shape our perceptions of violence? And how are we supposed to respond? And, or what about this? What does systematic violence, how does that role play in our communities? And how can we work towards peace and reconciliation? All right, I got one more. How should the church respond to violence in our neighborhoods? And how do we bring about healing and hope? All right, wait, I got more and more. I lied. How do we reconcile a loving God and a just God with the existence of suffering and violence in the world? One more question, I promise, this time. Is, is God, our God a violent God? There seems to be a lot of violence in the Bible. And, and how do you reconcile the two? How can our God be loving and yet there's violence in the scriptures. One more. No, I'm kidding. That, that's all my questions. But these are questions that I heard all the time from youth and young adults and adults throughout the 20 years of my ministry. Violence in the Bible can be really hard to understand. It's hard to make sense of stories like the flood in Genesis or the destruction of civilizations. These narratives seem to paint a picture of a God who is harsh and at times even violent. Some of these stories in the Bible even feel like they contradict who God is and what we're told about God. But if God is loving and merciful and full of joy and hope as revealed in Jesus and talked about in church, how do we reconcile these troubling stories of judgment and violence? Is it possible to reconcile God and his justice with his love. Or maybe you're saying, what violence? God is full of love and joy and peace, and he's so compassionate and kind. But we're going to look at a story. We're going to look at a story from, uh, about Noah. And it's a story about a great flood in Genesis that I mentioned earlier. And it's a story that many of us grew up. We're going to start, actually, by reading a children's Bible. Um, this is one of my favorite children's Bible. Uh, it's this beautiful oil paintings inside, which is one of the reasons I love it. And then we're going to see what the, the scriptures say to us. Many years passed away. Adam and Eve had children who had more and more and more children. Soon there were people all over the world, but they turned into selfish and greedy people. None of them cared about God. No one, that is, except Noah. Noah was a good man who loved God. God made a plan to start all over with Noah. Noah, because you love me, I will save you and your family. But you have to do your part. Go and build an ark in a huge boat. Collect animals of every kind and food to feed them. Take your wife, your sons, and their wives. Then watch and wait, and I'll send water from heaven and, and water from the deep parts of the earth to cover the entire world. The flood will wipe out everything, but you will be safe inside the ark. Now, when I read the children's version, I feel like there's a few parts that are missing here. And uh, there's a couple crucial elements. So here's what Genesis 6 uh, says, 11 through 13. 
Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both of them and the earth. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. Now, as you read these two different versions, they sound, there's a little bit of difference in them, right? The kids' version tells us a very joyful, positive, and, and the scriptural, the one that I read out of the NIV, sounds a little bit more grim. And if we only had a sampling of, this was the only sampling of the scriptures we had. This is the only understanding we had of God. What would we think about God? Perhaps we might respond like Richard Dawkins, a renowned atheist, who said, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty and unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. Would we think that God was an awful God if we just read this scripture? Would we think that he was an unforgiving God? Here's what Thomas Paine, the author of Common Sense and the Age of Reason, said. The Bible is a history of wickedness that has served to corrupt and brutalize mankind. And for my part, I sincerely detest it as I detest everything that is cruel. Would we shudder in fear? Would we believe that God doesn't even care if we just read this little glimpse of the scriptures. And it's okay to think that, feel that some of these scriptures are confusing and sometimes even unsettling. They can leave us wondering about who God is. But as we dive into this le- uh, lesson today, I hope that you see the balance between God's justice and mercy. And perhaps what we'll see is that God's actions, though at times feel severe, may not be arbitrarily cruel, but instead perhaps they serve a purpose. And perhaps the stories in the Bible that are brimming with violence teach us something about human nature and God's nature. Or perhaps they are just remnants of an ancient harsh world. Can we learn anything from them? Can we take anything from them? My hope is today that we see that God addresses evil in a corrupt society and works to bring about redemption and restoration. He has a divine order, a perfect plan, a beautiful plan for his creation, for his world and for each of us. And while the world is working to hinder it, God is working to restore what has been lost, to help us to experience the fullness of life. And ultimately, our focus will turn to the cross where we'll see God's justice and love meet perfectly where I hope you'll see that Jesus' sacrifice is the ultimate response to the problem of sin and violence. And that our God is not only just, but redemptive and loving. We'll focus on understanding God's judgment and justice, God's desire for repentance and restoration, and God's ultimate expression of love through Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, glorious and gracious God, we see violence all around us. We see violence in this world. We see violence uh, in the scriptures. And God, we don't know how to reconcile all of it. Our heart is troubled by what we see and what we hear. But God, we know that you are a good God. And that you have a way to restoration. A way to heal the brokenness in our world. And so, God, may we lean into your word and discover what you have to say about this. In your son's precious and holy name, amen? Amen. Well, uh, the other day, me and my wife were trying to pick a show. And we like completely different shows. She likes reality shows and crime scene uh, documentaries. And I like the comedies or the goofy detective shows like Monk. And so for some reason, we ended up watching a documentary about a horrific crime that showed the brutal uh, investigation and the crime that took place. And following the arrest of the individual, there was this long, suspenseful trial. And everyone is waiting for justice to be served. And the victims are hoping for closure. And, uh, And if the judge 
as we're watching this, if the judge lets this person go, I'm thinking, how is justice being served? We just allowed a criminal to go free, and the victims would be, remain unprotected. And it would send a message that there's no consequence to his actions. On the other hand, if the judge delivers a fair sentence, there's a sense of satisfaction like justice is done. The criminal is held accountable and the victims can begin to heal. It's the sense of balance and righteousness that we are looking for, a resolution when uh, wrongs are righted. Now, one of the things I've noticed about the Bible is it doesn't always soften things for us. It doesn't always make it easy for us to digest. Sometimes we might even think it makes God look bad or his followers look bad. In many cases, it simply tells the story and leaves us wondering, what is going on here? We have a God, we witness an incredible God of love and grace And then we also see in the scriptures pain, mistakes, and yes, even blood and violence, the raw messiness of life. And we wonder, what kind of book am I reading? Pastor and writer John Piper said it like this, the reason there is is such an abundance of violence in the Bible is because there is so much violence in the world. And so we must ask the ultimate question, why is that? The Bible is documenting what is. It's not creating what is, it's just telling us what is the reality. And sometimes, as it describes the world, it gives us all the gory details, while appearing to leave out answers to the questions we wish could be so neatly resolved. But the truth is, the reality of faith and life and God's justice isn't always tidy, like tying up a bow. In the same way that we watch crime shows and the details can be brutal and unsettling. And oftentimes I have to look away from many of these shows. We want, we hoping for justice to be served. We want wrongs to be made right when we watch these shows. And in the same way, we hope in life everything is made right in our justice. But God has a different level of justice. God's judgment in the Bible, though, time, though difficult at times to understand, actually serve a purpose. They aren't arbitrary acts of violence, but are actions of just and a righteous God committed to stopping the spread of evil and restoring what has been lost. His justice isn't about destruction for destruction's sake, but about protecting the innocent and bringing healing where sin has caused harm. And just as in those courtroom scenes bring a sense of resolution when justice is served, God's judgments are about restoring righteousness and peace, even when we can't fully understand it. And many times when I read the scriptures, I don't understand what's going on. But I realize that God is always working on our behalf to bring about balance and to restore what has been broken. His ultimate goal is to heal the damage caused by sin. We're going to take another look at Noah. This is a bigger sampling. This is a bigger part of the story. Verses 5 through 8. The Lord saw how the great wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth every... Uh, the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in his eyes. Did you notice how sin had filled the whole earth? How God's creations were committing shockingly wicked crimes in the most outrageous and outlandish and offensive ways. The scriptures say that the Thoughts of humanity were consumed with evil all the time, that their hearts were completely turned away from God, that this widespread sinfulness wasn't just a surface problem, but it was a bitter root from which all violence and oppression and moral decay flowed. Humanity's rebellion had corrupted God's world and creation, distorting the beauty and order that God had created. This wasn't just an accident. This was deliberate, intentional, Evil wasn't just present, it was constant, relentless, and all-consuming. 
Stealing, murder, sacrifices, and much more were being committed. No traces of good could be found, not even for a moment. The stream of sin ran deep and strong, and God saw it. And the Creator wept. He wept for His creation. I want you to imagine for a moment, and maybe it's not hard given our current uh, world circumstances, a world of such chaos and disorder and destruction, a world in which nothing feels right, where even the foundations of the world feel unsettled, and ask yourself, what would you do to bring about righteousness and peace and restoration? What would you do to bring about righteousness, peace, and restoration? Would you allow the injustices to continue, the wicked crimes, the suffering and the grief to continue on? Would you ignore the pleas of the people, or would you engage in a way that brought about a right order of things? God wasn't a passive ob observer. He, his heart broke for his creation. His heart broke for you and I. He wasn't indifferent to what was happening. His heart ached like seeing a child fall from grace. He was not only displeased by their actions, but he was deeply grieved. Tears fell from heaven, knowing that how much had been lost in the process. Humanity's sin hurt God. It pierced the heart of the Creator, as it is represented a tragic departure from the life he intended for his creation from the beautiful, perfect plan he had for us. Yet even in his grief, yet even in his grief, God's heart was solely not one of anger or resentment, but like a father who longs to restore a wayward child, God's justice and judgment were meant to stop the evil, cleanse the corruption, and bring healing to a broken world that was crying out in pain. Does it feel like the world is crying out in pain once again? He saw the harm that sin had caused, and in his love and in his love, he desired not just punishment, but restorations. God's goal was always to repair what had been lost, to restore righteousness and peace and the relationship he intended to have with creation, to right-size the world and bring about joy. Through judgment, God was not wiping away hope, but rather making a pathway for redemption, paving a way for healing and hope. This is a God who hears our cries, who hears our pain. This is a God who is deeply saddened by the injustices of the world. Understand God's judgment and justice is not arbitrary, but a necessary act aimed at stopping evil, restoring righteousness, and bringing healing to a broken world. Stopping evil, restoring righteousness, and healing to a broken world. This is a God who weeps with us. When you're going through pain, when you experience an injustice, when you see violence around this world, this God weeps with us. This is not a God that is distant and far away, but this is a God that is close and sees the pain that is being caused in this world and says, what would you have me do to stop this suffering? Should I sit idly by and allow the suffering to continue? How should I engage in this world? What would you do to bring peace, righteousness, and restoration to this world? All right, I just got a quick side note. Um, I, uh, I love beauty and nature. I love all that God has created in this world. I'm just not very good at taking care of plants. My wife actually says, I literally abolish everything. I'm like the black plague. I just wipe everything out. She even asked me to trim a bush. And I didn't just trim it. I decimated it. You couldn't even recognize it afterwards. So she goes, we're going to let a real gardener take care of this. Okay, honey, I, I'll try. But, you know, one of the things I, I appreciate about gardeners is when they see something dying, like a tree or bush, a tree that was once healthy that is now falling apart, the gardener doesn't just sit idly by, but they actually begin this process of pruning, not decimating, 
note that, uh, they cut away the dead branches, uh, removing what is unhealthy to save the tree. And though it may look harsh, uh, the pruning is actually done with the intent to heal and restore the tree to its former vitality so that once again it can thrive. In the same way, God's judgment can sometimes feel like harsh pruning. We may not understand what he is doing. We may not see the full story at play. He cuts away sin and the brokenness in our lives. And we may not understand it. We may, not go, we may question it. But just as a gardener knows the dead branches must be removed for new growth, God knows that sin must be dealt with in order for healing and restoration to take place. His judgment is a redemptive act. The process may feel painful. It may make us feel uneasy. Heck, we may even question God's actions and his character, but his ultimate goal is not to destroy, but to bring about restoration, to save and renew. It's what we see in the story of Noah. God had a bigger plan and purpose for humanity, a plan that not even Noah understood. And with humanity in such chaos and destruction and hurting each other, where there was no trace of goodness, not even for a moment where the stream of sin ran deep and strong, God the Creator wept for His creation. He knew He had to prune what was lost to make a way for something new. I love in Genesis 6 that just as the Lord is about to wipe out the earth, we begin to see his bigger picture where one person found favor, just one, in God's eyes. And God uses this one person, Noah, to restore what has been lost. Genesis 6, 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Then in Genesis 9, after God begins the restoration process with Noah, God tells Noah that he will never flood the earth again. That through Noah, he's going to try and restore what had been lost. Here's what it says in 12 through 13. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant. I am making between you and me and every living creature with you a covenant for all generations. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and earth. God's actions were about getting us back to the fullness that he intended for us. When sin took hold of our lives and threatened to destroy that everything that God had planted, but in his mercy, God cuts away what is harmful. His goal is not merely to remove the sin, as we see in Noah, but to restore life and purpose to, uh, to what it was originally created for to retrieve back what had been lost. The pruning is a necessary part to get us back, to restore us, to restore us to right relationship with him and his plan for us so that we might flourish again. You see, his plan is for our good. And we see this in another powerful story, in the story of Jonah, where Jonah is a reluctant prophet, to say the least. And we, uh, we catch another glimpse of God's plan for humanity here. You see, God calls Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh, a wicked city, so that their hearts might be turned back to God. It says that there was widespread sinfulness. It wasn't just a surface problem. It was a bitter root from which all violence, oppression, and moral decay flowed. Nineveh's rebellion had corrupted the very nature of their world distorting the beauty and the order God had created. Evil wasn't just present there. It was constant, relentless, and all-consuming. It sounds all too familiar, kind of like when a deja vu, like we've been here before, like humanity is stuck on stupid. It's like it's a river of evil flowing from the human heart, which runs wild without a dam of civil authority to keep it from spilling out over the whole earth and corrupting it with violence. But when God, in his great grace and mercy, calls the prophet to redeem what had been lost, Jonah runs away from God's redemptive plan, and God has to send a giant fish to swallow him up and spit him out in front of Nineveh, despite the people's wickedness. God weeps for them. God deeply cares about them. God offers them a chance to repent, showing that in his heart is geared towards mercy and healing, even in the face of judgment. The book of Jonah underscores that no one is beyond God's grace. 
and his goal is always to restore, not destroy. And yet, and yet what I find so fascinating about this story is Jonah becomes enraged at God for showing mercy instead of wrath to the wicked people in Nineveh. What? Why are you upset that God showed mercy instead of wrath? Does not Jonah want to restore the righteousness and peace? Does not Jonah want to restore what had been lost? We're going to take a look at Jonah 4, 1 through 2, and we'll see how Jonah's anger, Jonah's inability to see God's plan describes God's gracious character. Jonah 4, 1 through 2. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't that this what I said? Lord, when I was still at home, that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God. I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God. Slow to anger, slow to anger, and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Oh, what a gracious and compassionate God. God's warning to the people of Nineveh through Jonah wasn't meant for their destruction, but was a call to repentance. And when, and when Nineveh changed their ways, God relented from sending disaster. And this shows us that even in the midst of sin, even when we are adverse to God, even when we're creating violence and destruction, God is always ready to forgive. God is always ready to show us his grace and mercy and restore, restore those who return back to him. He longs for his creations to be made right. God's grace is inexhaustible. His love is unlimited. His desire for repentance and restoration always remains. Jonah 4.11. Here we hear the heart of the Heavenly Father as a God calls out to Jonah for being upset at a dead plant of all things. Meanwhile, he was not upset at the people who seemed dead to God. Here's what God says to Jonah. And should I not have been concerned for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? One soul is worth more to God than the whole world. And we are called to deeply care for the eternal of our own soul, but the souls of others. The beautiful truth is that God always shows mercy and is always ready to give us hope, even when we struggle or feel like God's grace is limited. He reminds us that his mercy is more than abundant, even when we don't understand his judgment or anger. God's heart is always open to us and ready to restore us back to him, no matter where we are, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done. This is a God who's not just acting arbitrarily and causing violence and mischief. This is a God who's working to restore his creation. Amen. God's desire for repentance and restoration shows his mercy, ready to heal and renew all back to him. Ready to heal and renew all back to him. This is an incredible God. And one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible come from Galatians 2.20. And this is where we see the, the Bible, the story of the Bible, its judgment, repentance, and restoration find its fulfillment in Christ, where we see the plan that God had for humanity the whole time. One of the reasons I love this verse is because God uses a violent act against him to bring about redemption to a broken humanity. God uses a violent act against him to bring redemption to a broken humanity. Many in the first century expected Jesus to be a powerful warrior who would use his ultimate strength and power to lead a violent military campaign to conquer the world, to wipe out the Romans who were the power at the time, like God had done in the story of Noah or was about to do in Nineveh. But instead, but instead God came to earth in a way that no one could have imagined as a humble, compassionate carpenter who became a teacher showing love and grace rather than force. Here's what Galatians 2.20 says. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. 
The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The violent act was the crucifixion on the cross. This verse beautifully cap captures the transformative power of Jesus' sacrifice. Through Christ, God expresses love in the most powerful way by sending his own son to take the penalty for our sin, our brokenness, our destruction, our cruel actions that grieved his heart by sending his son to take the penalty for our corruption that broke this perfect world and provide a way for humanity to be restored in right relationship with him, to give life to a people who seem dead to God. Jesus' violent death at the cross at our hands wasn't just an act of judgment on sin, but the ultimate act of love, offering everyone a path to redemption that we didn't earn or deserve. Through Jesus, what was broken by sin, damaged by humanity, and destroyed by this world is healed. And what was lost in humanity's violent rebellion is restored. Christ's resurrection signals the victory over sin and death, showing us that God's love is not just about saving us from judgment, a judgment that we have rightfully merited, but about giving us life and new hope. Jesus is the ultimate bridge between God's justice and mercy. He took on the judgment we deserve. He took on the monumental pain and the insurmountable suffering that we should have been given so that, so that we could be made right with God, so that we could experience restoration that we could never achieve on our own, a restoration that tells the whole story from the beginning of the scriptures till the end. His love offers more than forgiveness, it offers transformation. When we place our faith in Christ, we're not only saved from our consequences of sin, but we also made new, restored in right relationship with God and given the promise of eternal life. God's love expressed through Jesus brings healing to the deepest parts of our soul. It heals the parts that we, we don't let anyone else see or know. It's the brokenness and the, and the hurt and the pain and the grief that is inside of us. It is everything that we have lost to sin. Jesus restores and renews and heals. God's ultimate expression of love through Jesus Christ demonstrates the plan for humanity, offering redemption, healing, and new life for all who believe. Offering redemption, healing, and new life for all who believe this is a God unlike any other. This is the only way I know to bring healing and restoration to a broken and hurting world, a violent world. Now, I'll say, personally, I still struggle with some of the violence in the scriptures. And I str struggle with seeing violence in this world. And I don't understand all the time what God is doing or how he's doing it, or why he did that in the scriptures. And I'm not here to give you a religious platitude or even a justification for all the violence we see in the world or in the scriptures. But one of the things I have discovered is as I read the whole story from beginning to end, I see that our God is good, and ultimately his plan for us is good. I don't see God acting randomly, or that his judgments are accidental acts of violence but deliberate actions rooted in his commitment to stop evil and restore righteousness, even in stories like the Old Testament that I still don't understand fully. And I've done seminary, and I've read these scriptures my whole life, and yet I'm still perplexed. But what I see is that God consistently acts against injustice. He, he, consistently, he consistently works to bring about restoration in a violent and broken world. Just imagine if God never took action. What if God didn't care about the people during Noah's time or the city of Nineveh? Would that be a just God to allow those horrendous evil acts to continue to take place, to allow corruption and suffering to continue on? God's justice serves to protect his creation and provide opportunities for healing. His heart is not only to destroy, but to confront sin and create new conditions of a new life. The scriptures even say that God takes no pleasure in the death, the death of the wicked. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. 
God's desire is always about repentance and restoration, which is evident in the stories of Jonah and, and Nineveh, where his warnings of judgment come with the hope of repentance. And as we understand his bigger story, we see that God does not delight in punishing, but he longs for his creation to return back. He longs for us to be restored in right relationship with him. His mercy is always available to those who seek it, showing that no matter how far we strayed, no matter how far we've gone, no matter how broken we are, no matter how much violence is in this world, he is always restoring what has been lost. The ultimate expression of God's love, the whole story for humanity, is the restorative act of Jesus Christ. And through li Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we see a new life. We see a world that can be redeemed and made new. God took what was meant for evil and turned it into good. So what does God say about violence? Well, understanding God's judgment and judgment justice is not arbitrary act aimed at stopping evil, restoring righteousness, and bringing healing and broken. It's aimed at stopping evil, restoring righteousness, and bringing healing to a broken world. This is a God who weeps with you, who hears your pain, who hears you crying out. And he says, my child, my child, I love you. And I am working to restore all things new in you. Number two, God's desire for repentance and restoration shows his mercy, ready to heal and renew all back to him. To renew all who turn back to him. When we call Jesus our Lord and Savior, we can be healed. It is the only place that we can find healing and restoration. And number three, God's ultimate expression of love through Jesus Christ demonstrates plan for humanity, offering redemption, healing, and a new life to all who believe. No matter how far you've gone, no matter how much violence there is, no matter how broken this world is, God is waiting for us to return to him. And this is the incredible God that we have. And all throughout his story, he's trying to redeem and restore us back, to get us back to his original plan and perfect creation. So we're going to pray. And maybe this is an opportunity to make yourself right with God, to lean into God's goodness and grace, to trust in him. And if you've never accepted Jesus into your life, this is an opportunity to find a new life in him, to confess your life over to him. But if you have already accepted Jesus, at the end of that prayer, we'll do a confessional. And I invite you to remind yourself of the goodness of, grace, of God. Heavenly Father, glorious and gracious God, you are good. And God, I am blown away by your kindness and your grace and your mercy. I'm amazed at your love. And God, why I don't understand everything that you do or why you do it. I don't understand your judgments all the time. I don't understand all the violence in this world. I don't understand the violence I see in the scriptures. God, what I do know is that you're a good God. And everything you do is for our good. Everything you do is to restore us back to your original creation, to bring us whole, to help us to thrive, to feel your presence and grace and love and mercy, to, make, to be made whole in you once again. Oh, Lord, when we look around and we see the cries of this world, even the foundation of the world being shaken, oh, Lord, May we respond with your grace and mercy and love. God, you have planted crossroads here 
so that we might share your peace, your righteousness, your joy, your hope with Clayton, with Concord, with Pittsburgh, with our friends, with our families, with our neighbors. You're calling us to speak that righteousness, that hope, that restoration into a world that is so broken, that is crying out for help. And God, may we not run away as Jonah did from Nineveh, but may we live into this call that you've placed upon us for 48 years and you continue to place on us every day going forward. May we reach out to our friends and our neighbors and our family and speak of your truth and your justice and your love. And God, may they hear that and receive that and turn from their brokenness, lay it all at the altar and discover a new life in you. So God, I give you thanks. I give you thanks for Crossroads and its faithfulness. And God, may we be faithful to you and to your call that you've placed on our heart. To this call that you've placed us right here, right now. we never stop sharing the word of God, your truth and love with the Ninevehs around us. In your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. And if you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Please forgive me. Come into my life receive you as my Lord and Savior. Now help me to live for you the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray.